Thank you all for coming. My name is Lucas. This is John. Um, when we <laughs> thank you, thank you. When we first sat down, Charlene, John, and I, and started to sift through the huge list of Hampshire, tiny list actually, of Hampshire alumni that work in sustainable endeavors, we immediately came uh, in contact with a problem. What do we call these people? Hampshire alum alumni are very difficult to fit into boxes, like all Hampshire community members. Um, they, they aren't really typified by the word job, what they do. It's more maybe, I don't know, Frankenstein or adventure. In a true sense, almost all Hampshire alumni are entrepreneurs. Um, and no one exemplifies this more to me than Josh Goldman. Um, from his Division Three work um, on sustainable aquaculture, he went on to found and become the CEO of Australis Aquaculture, an award-winning company that integrates ecological principles um, with business to find the best food for both human and environmental health. Um, in, a, in a short five years, he's taken the fish Baramudi from an unknown organism to um, a sustainable superfood that's sold in over 4,000 retail organizations. And Josh has also worked closely with uh, leading conservation organizations such as Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, all to improve the environmental performance of aquaculture. Uh, he was the recipient of the International Food Technologies Award for Innovation and was also named a Seafood Champion for Sustainability by the Seafood Choice Alliance. And without further ado, as you're enjoying your pie, I would like to welcome Josh Coleman to the stage. All right, it's so fun for me to be back here and to talk to you about my journey from Hampshire and uh, how it's evolved over the years. So I'm really psyched and I appreciate everybody coming out. So I just want to start by presenting some facts about the oceans. The oceans, you probably all know, cover 70% of the Earth's surface. They provide more than 99% of the living space on Earth. 80% of the human population lives within 60 miles of the coast. Fully 90% of the world's biomass, the weight of all living things, is in the sea. And even with all the problems of overfishing, the sea still offers a really vibrant wild food system. And we like to talk about fish as the world's last wild food. Of all the environments where carbon is stored, the atmosphere, the oceans, and the land, 93% of the total carbon on Earth is stored in the oceans. And yet only 5% of the ocean floor has been mapped. So there's a real gap. Uh, very little of the oceans are conserved, less than 1%. And fish, you may be surprised to learn, are the most valuable traded food crop in the world. Uh, about 8% of the world's population is involved in fisheries and aquaculture, tremendous number, mostly of uh, poorer folks in developing countries. So in this talk, what I want to do is I'll share my journey from Hampshire uh, and the development of the technology, where it came from, the ideas that led me to, uh, to where I am today. And I just want to start in the tradition of inquiry at Hampshire uh, by asking a question, which you see here. But this question is also a question about the design of questions themselves, because a well-designed question really has the power to guide us intellectually over a long period of time. And a well-designed question is durable, it's adaptable, and it can help us navigate our studies, our careers, and even help us find our purpose in life. So for me, the question was, how can we better use the oceans to feed ourselves in the future? It all began when I arrived at Hampshire in the early 80s, and not unlike the Occupy movement of today, students were involved in protesting in this case, uh, the nuclear power plant, the last one that was constructed in the US in Seabrook, New Hampshire. And upon returning from one of the marches, Hampshire professor of physics and energy policy, Alan Krast, asked a question to a friend of mine that would literally change both of our lives. Alan said, you know what you're against, but what are you for? And our response to this question was, we're for growing food that can sustain ourselves and some portion of this community on a year-round basis, primarily using the sun, the wind, and minimal fossil fuels or fertilizers. So armed with about $1,500 from community council, the Enfield Solar Greenhouse was constructed in 1980. And a year later, I moved in and built a lot of what you see here, which are these barrels to store the sun's energies, the uh, fish tanks, 
uh, suspended hydroponics up here, drip irrigation growing tomatoes. We built a windmill in an attempt to power it all. We never actually hooked it up. And this was a, a really a great student-driven experience. Hampshire got behind this idea and in 1983 found funding to construct the coal science bioshelter. And with guidance from Charlene and Larry, my inquiry took on greater definition and we began to look at really what drove these systems. How did the fish and the plants interact? What was the right ratio to remove nutrients from the water? How do you optimize the performance of bacterial-based filtration to be able to reuse water on a continuous basis? And really was dri driving towards both an understanding and a technology to do closed system fish farming here in New England. When I graduated in 1985, uh, I asked a much more difficult question, which is, could I make a living doing this? And over time, I learned that these integrated aquaponic systems, growing tilapia, a tropical fish from Africa, which has subsequently really exploded into a huge source of global protein, and basil and greens, uh, we found that it was actually very difficult to integrate these two things. Tropical fish put humidity into the water, and the plants didn't like the humidity, it caused molds. Uh, so ultimately, as we decided to expand, and with the foundation that we created, we went towards just growing one species fish, and an originally hybrid striped bass in Turner's Falls, which is not far from here, and it's become the world's largest indoor fish farm. About 55 people work on the farm. It produces a little over a million pounds of fish a year that are sold across North America. Over time, uh, we learned a lot more about fish reproduction. Fish have tiny eggs, and so uh, in order to grow many species of fish, one has to establish a food chain and grow algae and zooplankton to feed the larval fish before they're large enough and developmentally mature enough to convert to dry feeds. Shows the, the little view of the facility, the nursery and the grow out tanks. And uh, we move the fish progressively through larger and larger tanks as they grow, ultimately to these very large tanks, which you see in the, in the photo on the right. Well, as nice as this project was, as it was developing throughout the 1980s, the world really began to change around us. And the consensus view is that we're really in the midst of a tectonic shift in what people eat raising real questions about how we're going to feed ourselves. And the, and the consensus view today is that the middle class is likely to more than double over the next 20 years. And one of the things that's been true historically is that as people become wealthier, they eat a lot more animal protein. When we look at traditional crop farming on land, the growth of human population has been met with tremendous increase in agricultural productivity over the past 50 years. You can see a graph of U.S. corn yields here, declining use of fertilizer in farms through traditional agriculture. And so even with a huge increase in population, the availability of food has increased. But, and there's a series of buts, as we all know, this system is very vulnerable due primarily to its profound reliance on fossil fuels, which is intrinsically connected to rising, fuel, rising food prices, unsustainable water use, and the fact that so much of total food production is going into animal agriculture, 50% of all crops grown going into agriculture and going into animal agriculture. So when we look ahead, really over the course of the next 40 years, the time period that will comprise most of your professional working lives, we can be pretty sure that the global food system will experience unprecedented pressures. Human population will grow, animal consumption will increase, and the projection is that the need for total food production is going to increase 70% over this very short amount of time in the face of all of the stresses that climate change will undoubtedly place. So what is the role of fish in our collective food future? And I want to explore this first starting with a little bit of what's happening in the wild fisheries. And it's a story that we're exposed to, but I want to give you my perspective on it. We hear a lot about peak oil. And peak oil is a story of even with better and better technology, with going to more 
remote environments, at a certain point, we're just not going to be able to produce more. Well, peak fish happened 25 years ago. And if you substitute oil for fish, you, you really have the first resource which has really hit a wall on productivity around the world. And what's happened is as we've overfished the high value species, the, the fish at the top of the food chain, increasingly we move down to the, toward the base of the food chain. And this is quite scary because when you erode that base, you really create structural changes in the whole ecosystem that are very hard to predict. This is a little uh, graphic that shows, if I can get it to play, yep. you see the year in which peak fishing happened around the world being animated in front of you. And the fact that fishing has essentially gone further and further offshore and what were previously de facto biological reserves are now all subject to fishing, with the exception of the poles. How did this happen? Well, like most things, the answer is really an intersection of historical processes. In the US, the example close to us, the Congress passed, reauthorized something called the Magnuson Act in 1982, and we basically kicked all the foreigners out of our waters. We created a 200-mile exclusive economic zone. And in conjunction with the creation of the 200-mile economic zone, we made a lot of credit available to fish farms, $800 million of credit to, uh, to fishermen. $800 million of credit became available in the 1980s through something called the Fisheries Obligation Guarantee, which meant if you were a US citizen and you could sign your name, you could borrow money at basically treasury rates very cheaply to capitalize the fishery. So vessels very quickly got a lot larger, they got a lot more numerous, and they actually got a lot smarter because they got armed with GPS and onboard databases that allowed fishers to pinpoint fish in the oceans very effectively. And so we ended up in the last 20 years with a situation where we have essentially global overcapacity of the fishing fleet, which is probably 100%. We've got twice as many boats as we need. So it's become hard for fishers to make a living and at the same time, a lot of pressure on catching what were maybe not desirable species and now bringing those to market. Uh, one piece of good news is that with the rise in oil prices over the last couple of years, fuel subsidies, which were behind a lot of this as well, ended generally around the world in 2010. So countries stopped providing fuel subsidies to fishing boats. Well, Okay, this is complicated, but how do we manage these fisheries? How can the process be controlled? And really to, to very greatly oversimplify what's a, a pretty complex science, one of the key concepts that's historically been applied to managing wild fisheries is this concept of maximum sustainable yield. And it's really not unlike what you do when you weed your garden or you prune your apple tree. The idea is you take a stock of fish and you reduce the number to about half of the pristine biomass, the unfished biomass. And the idea is those fish that are left will actually have a lot more access to food and they'll grow faster. That's the idea and, and it works to a certain extent, but it relies on having a really accurate assessment of the biomass, knowing something about the stock structure, how the fish reproduce, having accurate catch data, and, and ultimately having everybody play by the rules. And really none of these things apply perfectly in the real world. What do we do? Uh, just really quickly. Well, some of the answers are we really need to get politics out of fisheries management and use science-based catch limits. We need to shift towards less destructive gear. Approximately a third of the world's catch is bycatch, which are generally tossed overboard, a very sad reality. On the policy and enforcement side, we need to reduce illegal fishing. But one of the real signs of hope, and, and you may not have heard this term, is marine protected areas. Only about 1% of the oceans are currently protected. I think that the, the number on land is like 16%. So there's a real asymmetry. And what's happened when we create marine protection areas, you can see the numbers, 750, 193% increases in the fish biomass within these reserves. So there's a lot of emerging science around how these work. Uh, and just in the last year, the state of California approved a series of nine marine protected areas, really groundbreaking conservation measure in the United States. And the idea is that each of these protected areas is close enough to each other that they represent 
parts of ecosystems that interact in a, in a beneficial way. We also need smarter markets, and you may have heard of the Marine Stewardship Council, and there's a whole series of efforts that are underway to really arm the buying sector, the professional buyers that buy at your supermarket or for food service here at Hampshire, as well as consumers to educate so that buying is integrated into a smarter seafood system. My vision is that on the aquaculture side, we're really only beginning to imagine the potential for food production that can come from farming the seas. And that in fact, fish, for reasons that I will explain, really sit at the center of more efficient food production, improved human health, the ability to begin to really sequester carbon in the oceans and enhance food security in, for the world. So what does that all mean? Well, I think the foundation is that when you compare fish to the traditional land animals that we rely on for protein, these are animals that are cold-blooded, that live in a gravity-free environment, and they generally have very little skeletal structure. And when you add all that up, we're able to convert feed to flesh with aquaculture species much, much more efficiently. So if we ate more fish and we grew those fish in a smart system, we would have the ability to really extend the agricultural grain base very far. And that's what we're, we're learning and we're applying today. And I think that has really driven the explosion of aquaculture that's happened over the last 15 years. Aquaculture is by far the fastest growing sector of the world food system. It's experienced double-digit growth. And in 2012, for the first time in the history of the world, farmed fish will reach parity with wild capture. So we'll have an equal amount of fish coming off of farms as we do from the seas. And the projections, you saw the graph of flat fisheries, is that really all of the growth in the future is going to come from farms. So there's an opportunity to make sure that we learn from the missteps of industrial agriculture and really use this opportunity as we're building a new industry to get this right and to build a smarter system. So how do we do that? Well, it's helpful, I think, to look back. And aquaculture is generally credited with being invented by the Chinese uh, about 5,000 years ago. And the Chinese, despite being a pre-scientific people at that time, had a remarkably ingenious system of polyculture that used nine different species of carp. And they understood that the pond was this really dynamic means to cycle nutrients. And they started with animal waste and grass feeding grass carp here, whose waste would then go in to the bottom. Other animals would eat the mud and the waste at the bottom, cycle those nutrients up into the water in dissolved form, and you'd get algae, which you had another species to eat. The algae would feed zooplankton and other species. So it was a really ingenious system. And it, in fact, grew about twice as much fish as a modern American catfish farm does today, which uses aeration and external feeds. So if we get it right, there's incredible ability to, to achieve productivity. Unfortunately, when that system didn't really survive the market very well, although the Chinese still produce huge amounts of carp, but in the last three decades, we've had three predominant aquaculture species that have grown up around the world. The first was shrimp farming in the 1980s. A, a Taiwanese scientist realized that if you cut the eye of a shrimp, you could get them to reproduce in captivity for reasons I can't explain to you. And with the successful reproduction, captive breeding of shrimp, shrimp farming rapidly developed around the world. And it produ produced a lot of employment for poor smallholder farmers, but it also took a huge amount of the world's mangroves, these incredibly important plants which sit at the interface of the coastal zone and are breeding habitat for plants with them. In some countries, as much as 70% of the mangroves were denuded. And it turns out that shrimp don't have much of an immune system, so they're subject to all kinds of viruses. Uh, this is a meeting I went to in Taiwan. These guys are not giants. This is the building that subsided into the ground from the extreme pumping of water from the shrimp farms around them. In the 1990s, the next explosion happened, and that was global salmon farming. Salmon farming had begun in the 1970s in the Scotland and Ireland, and uh, the Norwegians, who have a lot of well-developed coasts, began to grow salmon in massive numbers. But there's some real problems that have been uncovered. The first is that these are very energetic animals, which require 
a high degree of fat, of lipid in their diet. And where is that lipid going to come from? Well, it turns out that most of that lipid is coming from catching small fish in the ocean, manhaden, herring, anchovy, processing that into fish oil, and then feeding it to the fish. And so typically the math today is that it takes three to four pounds of wild fish to grow one pound of salmon. So while that may be economically very successful in a, in a vast market, it's ecologically uh, not really doing what we want aquaculture to do, which is build more fish in the world. And secondly, in this picture here, you see the beautiful environment that these salmon farms are located. Well, the, you have to be in very cold waters. Cold waters tend to be very energetic, so you need to park these sea cages inside of bays, which tend to be habitat for wild salmon. So there's an inherent conflict that happens. And when you have lots of animals parked near where there may be a wild salmon run, when those smolts, those immature salmon swim by, they are often uh, hurt by disease as they move past those wild fish. So there's a very unfortunate interaction in salmon farming. In 2000, a whole new development happened and really coming partly out of the development community, a lot of the work that Peace Corps did, um, the Israelis were very involved in tilapia farming. This is an herbivorous species native to Central and Northern Africa, exploded around the world and is now the second most broadly farmed species on the planet. And the beauty of tilapia is these are herbivores. Uh, they're very robust, they're very hardy to grow. Uh, and often the production is integrated with irrigation. So that fresh water which is being used to grow fish can in fact irrigate crops in a beneficial system. So this is a good thing. However, how do all these fish stack up as food? Fish really have a unique role nutritionally to play because they're the only source of two particular fatty acids, DHA and EPA. And your brain, if you were to weigh it and ask what is it, about one third of the weight of your brain is DHA. And the only way to get DHA is by eating it, uh, either from one fatty acid which we convert, and two, which is vegetable based, and two that you have to eat from fish. So this is quite important. And what happens, you can see here, some of the farm species, tilapia and catfish, which are best choices from an environmental standpoint actually have very little omega-3s. So they're not, they're not delivering the goods that we want from a health standpoint. Bad old farm salmon, red listed, great source of omega-3s, but at the cost of lots of wild fish. And to make matters worse, the quantity of omega-3 isn't the only thing at play. There's actually some other fatty acids, omega-6s, which are considered inflammatory and there was a study that came out last year that said, well, if you eat tilapia, it's pretty much equivalent to e eating bacon or a hamburger in terms of this ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 because those farm fish are being fed vegetable oils to meet their, their energetic needs. And so we're not, we haven't got there yet. So where do we go? Well, I went prospecting for the perfect fish, and I really asked the question, from an ecological standpoint, where would, where would th that fish live? What characteristics would it have? And there was a whole class of fish that we had not looked at really in depth in fish farming, and that's what we call didadromous species. And the interesting thing about didadromous fish, some of them, is that they breed in seawater, and then they go into freshwater. And the reason I found that interesting is that when you go to the tropics, a lot of the reproduction is driven by the moon. Well, this is a wonderful thing if you're a farmer because these fish will spawn on a year-round basis. And many of the tropical species are hugely fecund. The, the females will have literally millions of eggs, which is great because we want lots of babies. But those eggs are also little sacks of, guess what, DHA and EPA. That's how they're feeding the next generation. And yet, this is an animal that then goes, as it matures, into freshwater environments, which tend to be monsoonal meaning there's a wet season and a dry season. And in the dry season, the river is not flowing. The water becomes very hot. It becomes uh, very uh, low oxygen content. So this animal evolved in response to those pressures, an enormous gill, which is a great thing if you're a fish farmer and you want a, a robust animal. So we have a, a fish that eats low in the food chain that's hardy and yet has culinary characteristics like some of the most high value species, grouper, snapper, and sea bass. One challenge, no one ever heard of it. So 
we had to figure out how do we tell this story in a compelling way. And it, the, the great news is there's a lot of chefs as we were getting going six years ago that were really committed to sustainable seafood and were willing to lend us their fame, people like Michelle Nishan, who's behind the whole move to bring farmers markets to hospitals and to people on food stamps, and Anita Lowe, who's a culinary genius and a top chef, came with, partnered with us, not because we paid him money, but because they just wanted to see this happen. They felt it was important. And so we began to really build awareness to the point where Costco, major retailers that need tremendous amounts of volume, came knocking on our door and said, this is really interesting. We're very reliant today on tilapia, on salmon. We don't sell as much wild fish because the prices are too volatile. The supply is in jeopardy. They were making commitments to sustainable sourcing. And that led to a path of our being able to gain access to a lot of the major retailers. But it turns out that the closed system in Turner's Falls is really, the economics don't support that that if you're gonna grow fish in this perfectly controlled environment, uh, the cost is too high. And in part because we all like to eat our nice skinless, boneless white fillets. And if you grow the fish to a larger size, it's going to take more time. It's gonna reduce the productivity of the farm. So we looked further around the native habitat of the fish and we found our way to this wonderful bay in central Vietnam called Van Phong Bay. You're all welcome to visit, it's terrible there. And we adapted the recirculation technology for growing the small fish on land to a point where they were robust, they were no longer cannibalistic, we actually vaccinate them so they're not likely to get disease, and grow them to a size where they're also large enough that when they go to these offshore sea cages, they don't, we don't have to do net changes. And one of the problems with salmon farming is fish escape, and then what's the genetic impact of that? So we grow the fish large enough that we can avoid net changes, if you, anybody had a boat and you put it in the ocean, it's gonna be covered with all kinds of weed and barnacles. And the same thing happens at these cages, but we, rather than use chemicals, we, we basically clean them in situ. So we, we wash them without changing them. And our model has been focused on producing frozen fish where we reduce the carbon footprint of transport by about 90% relative to air freight. And in the US, 85% of the fish we eat is imported. It's an astonishing number. We really don't grow a lot of fish for reasons we can talk about. So, but if we're going to get fish and we're going to import them, we need to figure out how to grow them in a, in a responsible way and how to get them here without putting a lot of carbon into the environment. And we've built a brand that we call the Better Fish that really reflects the ecological prospecting that we did to find a better fish in looking at its habitat. And we've translated that into better tasting, better for you, and better for our planet. So what's next? Uh, what I'm really excited about is going back to the beginning of aquaculture, to that Chinese system, and beginning to do what's called integrated multitrophic aquaculture. One of the benefits of farming in the sea is that we can reduce our use of freshwater, which is going to be a problem, we all know, in the future. So our goal is to develop a scalable system in which we begin to actually grow a portion of the fish's food or other foods utilizing the waste products of the fish. And we're launching this in 2012. And our efforts will be directed towards really scaling up seaweed farming in a novel way and using very long mesh bags and auto more automated approach to doing this literally on a, on a kilometer scale. And our initial production will be of uh, a seaweed that's used for thickeners. So if you go to the, the cream and you have a nice uh, ice cream, a lot of why that ice cream tastes good is thickeners from seaweed. But we're really gonna use that as a platform to begin to learn how to do seaweed farming in an integrated fashion. So finally, I wanna close by sharing a vision for the possibility of farming in salt water. And I, I wanna just talk about a couple of things that I think are really exciting. There's a company called Martech Biosciences, and they went out about 10 years ago and began to prospect in the ocean for algae that could directly produce DHA. At that point, if you were a top researcher, you could get a little vial of DHA from National Institute of Health that probably cost $20,000. Well, today they can ship you a trainload of DHA. And part of why that's significant, our brains, is that 
we knew that babies that consumed infant formula had about a 10-point IQ deficiency versus breastfed babies. And a big part of the reason is lack of DHA. So today, DHA is in virtually all baby food coming from an algae that they discovered in the ocean. Very exciting. There's another company called Sapphire Energy, which is one of the uh, best-funded biofuel companies located in Southern California and Nevada. And they are working on what they call BioCrude, and basically creating feedstock that, if it works, will function as a cost-effective replacement for oil and all of the chemicals that are made from oil. And they're driving this Prius around the country with BioCrude. And then finally, there are enormous opportunities for participation by the world's poor. Uh, who make up the lion's share of aquaculturists. Uh, studies have shown that seaweed farming can increase the income of, of uh, peasant farmers five to six times versus farming on land. And so our model will be in partnership with small farmers in Vietnam to really scale this up. So I want to thank you and I'd be happy to take any questions.